All right, great. Uh, first of all, I'd like to. This is Alan Spy with Training Pros, and uh, first of all, I'd like to thank every, everybody for attending today. This will be our 12th Learning Views webinar series uh, that's been sponsored by Training Pros and Harrisburg University. So I think I'd like to thank the Harrisburg team as well um, for making this possible today. Uh, topic, top, top, the topic of this webinar is why learning loses business traction and how to get it back. And uh, as we go through the webinar today, a few things <clears throat> we'd like you know for you to take away from this session is to really get a better idea of how to align your learning goals with business objectives uh, and start implementing those at your places of business, or possibly even pursue additional education down the road for yourselves um, as a consultant or for your internal teams. Um, with Harrisburg University, really, they've given us um, the opportunity to really grow um, our key learnings uh, that we learn from our clients and from uh, the industry. And uh, Harrisburg uh, offers really a master's level program for professionals such as ourselves to really take these skills and um, really build on those and expand and then take them back to your places of business and, uh, and share them with your employees and your coworkers. So with that, with that, I'd like to introduce Tabitha Taylor. She's got over 25 years of experience in talent management and learning. And she's worked for some really big teams and some great companies. So Tabitha, I'll leave it to you. Right. Thank you so much. And I, I really want to thank Training Pros for inviting me to speak. I actually uh, use Training Pros as a client and now have the opportunity to work with Training Pros with some consulting as well. And they're just a great organization and really supported my success as a senior learning leader for some great companies. I, uh, I started my career 25 years ago in the cable industry and really have moved around and worked for some amazing organizations. Most re recently for Cox Automotive, which owns such companies as Auto Trader, Mannheim, which is the world's largest, largest auto auction, Kelly Blue Book. I've spent time at Starbucks and Boeing and a lot of other great brands. But what I've learned about business and, and learning traction really came primarily in the last probably five to eight years when learning tried to align more with the business strategy and really starting to be business partners. Currently today, I am the CLO and SVP for a company called Elite Team Dynamics. And our focus is really helping leaders, teams, and organizations to build and to sustain high performance. So we, we really work side by side with leaders to build those high performing teams that deliver business results. And through all of that, what I hope today is to share with you some of the things that I've learned and, and learn from my colleagues and from my clients and in hopes to help you as you navigate the waters of learning. So let's talk about today. This is our agenda today. It will go pretty quickly, I hope. It's interactive. There's a lot of opportunities for you to share your insights and feedback and answer some poll questions. Um, and then we'll, we'll continue. The first thing is we're going to talk about what is the business saying about learning and development. And I'll show some recent research that, that's been out there and talk a little bit about that. Then we're going to talk about the derailers that push L&D off course sometimes. And these derailers I've experienced myself, and I think there's some great learnings in there. We're also going to talk about some myths that L&D uses to get learning back on track. And unfortunately, sometimes those don't work. But there are some truths, and that's what we're really going to focus on, or what are the truths in learning development, and how can we start to look at learning a little different so that we're driving the right results for the business. I'm going to leave you with some key strategies that you can try. And then we'll have an open answer and question session if, if there's anything else I can support and help you with. That's why I'm here. It's just to help my fellow learning professionals and, and to make sure that we're all sharing in this great community called learning. So as I look back at my career, this is really how I feel sometimes. So as you look at that, have you ever felt like this? And I don't know about you, but I've led large global learning teams, lastly with, with Mannheim. I had a team of 15 learning professionals that supported 30,000 employees worldwide. So when you look at learning development, there's one thing that we can do, and that's we can do a whole heck of a lot with less. Many times we don't have large teams and we have to adjust to the business, and that's what I felt like. Mannheim has a pretty strenuous business planning process, yearly objectives, you go and plan, and I would align all of our learning strategies to those plans. But inevitably, throughout the year, halfway through the year, 
I would have senior executives meeting with me and going, why are you even doing that training? Even after they saw it at the beginning of the year and said, yeah, yeah, that looks good. Let's do this soft skills training on communication skills. And then they came back and said, why are we even doing that? And when that happened for two years in a row, I began to realize that I was missing something. Now, as we look at this, Justin, this is our, our first poll question. How many of you align your learning strategies and initiatives to your company's yearly goals and objectives? So it looks like we're trending that a lot of us do. Hey, Justin, looks like we can put the, the view the results. Okay. So I'm going to share with you, let's see what the industry is saying, because we're right, you're right along line. If you look at it, primarily we're even between yes, we share, yes, we don't. And then we had a couple that what strategy and I've been there as well. As we look at what we're saying, we know that 81%, this is a recent study from CLO Magazine, 81% of learning organizations align learning activity with business objectives, which is pretty interesting. So it's a pretty high percentage. That's pretty standard if you look at ADT and some of the also CEB's research, it runs along that same lines. But here's some interesting findings that, that were striking to me. 52% um, of line managers would not recommend working with the L&D teams to appear. And that's a two, 2015 CEB study that they just did on learning cultures. That's a very high percentage. The other interesting um, benchmark was only 34% of business leaders think L&D is effective at increasing performance. So if 81% of us are aligning, the larger percentage of us are aligning to business objectives, and yet if you were to go out and start meeting and, and really spending some time with your line managers where they're finding that learning is ineffective, there's a big disconnect to that. And I think that there's some challenges that L&D has that really lend to some of those perceptions. I feel many of these are perceptions. I don't think that they're reality, but we all know that a perception is a reality if we don't start talking about it and doing something about it. So when we think about that, Justin, this is the next poll, what is the biggest challenge? And I've got a couple of them up there. If you can kind of, the first thing is aligning learning across all business units. Next is managing and providing multiple delivery options to the business. Responding to changing market or business changes, data and reporting integrations with multiple sources and then integrating a global workforce. So as you look at those, what are, what's the biggest challenge for you today? So it looks like responding to, to changing business. Yeah, that's a definite, especially today when business is, is moving at breakneck speed. And delivery options, absolutely. That's about 21%. Right. And lower on the global and data integration, again, lower, lower on the So as we look at research, this is a CLO study that I'm gonna share with you that talks about those challenges. It's a recent CLO study, it was done in 2014, and, and I have these links on the back of the, the, um, the presentation so that you, you can read those yourself. But what's interesting is you're right along the lines of 29% challenge, their biggest challenge is aligning operations across all business units. I think that's indicative of all of the big businesses we have, but more importantly, we have all these different departments all having a different need when it comes to learning development and skill development. Delivery options, again, you know, how do we find out all the delivery options that are out there and do that in an effective manner? 90% are responding to business changes. That's a little higher for this group. 
which I think that I would probably drive that a little higher. 18% was integrated data and only 11% were the global workforce. So as we look at those things, what we know is we know that learning and development struggles with some derailers that get us off track, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So as we look at across businesses and what the research says, and then I've taken in all of my interviews with colleagues and, and businesses that I work with, there's four things that really impact and derail learning and development from a business traction standpoint. The first is that many times learning and development is perceived as being disconnected from the business. And what, what we mean by that is, is that you're driving towards a skill set or a learning, but many of the line managers don't think that learning and development has a clear grasp of really what the business is and what the business needs are from a business standpoint. And that could be from a customer standpoint, it could be from a product standpoint, standpoint or, or a business challenge standpoint. But just having that perception that L&D is disconnected. The other perception that, that is, is that L&D is considered or makes things too complicated. So it's too complicated to get to learning. You have to go through three systems to log on to take something. You don't know what class you're going to get. The learning curriculum is too complicated. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I have to take this test. Um, and it's, it's making all of those points of service, being able to get in and to, to get to learning, it's complicated. And we've experienced that. One program that we had at Mannheim that I was extremely proud of, she now to be horrifically complicated for everyone that had to get into it. And we could never figure out why our numbers were so low on this great team building program. And finally, one of our customers said, well, it takes me five clicks to get into it. And then I'm there for a half hour before I even get to the meat of it. It was just too complicated for them to really get through. The, la the other third is low relevance to the business. So when people look at learning and development or they look to see what learning opportunities are there, many people look at that and say, well, that's not really relevant to me personally or my position, or it's not relevant to what I need to do to do my job. Or many times as leaders get promoted throughout the organization, when they reach a certain level, there's the perception that a leader doesn't need any development on their core skills anymore. So there's a lot around low relevance. And then the fourth is re low reputation in the workplace. So many times learning and development can have a reputation that they do a lot of start and stop. So nothing ever seems to get delivered to the fullest. Um, and that goes back to some of those earlier statistics that we saw with um, just low re reputation in the workforce. As we look at those, disconnected, complicated, low relevance, real reputation, we know that we're challenged with those, so what do we do about it? So as you look at your organization, what are maybe some of your organization's biggest derailers? For us at Mannheim and for Cox, it was that we made things too complicated and that we had low re relevance to certain positions so people didn't understand that th that was really relevant to them. So those are kind of my two that were were the biggest for us. So I'm going to let you vote with a poll. Where do you think some of your biggest challenges are in your organization? Looks like higher percentage of complicated. Seems. So it looks like our biggest opportunity, just as the team and the group that's on here, is really around making things complicated or having too many hoops that you have to jump through. And I would say that from my experience, that seems to be the biggest one that people struggle with the best. And then the second is just being perceived as being disconnected from the business. Um, many times those are perceptions. They're not really the reality. But we know that we want to work through that and become perceived as a business partner and a business driver. So we can close that one out, Justin, and go into some. So what we want to talk about for the rest of our time is how do we get back on track? We know that we have those derailers, so what do we really do about them? And what are some strategies that can help? So we're going to go over four go-to myths that L&D uses to try and get back on track. They rarely have lasting impact, though, so we're going to talk about that. Next, we're going to talk about 4L&D truths when leveraged are the wave of the future. It's really how business is changing and how we can really start to be relevant to the business. 
And then I'm going to leave you with three strategies that I've experienced huge success with that can help live drive learning and traction. So here's myth number one, or let's question number one. When learning programs get off track, it's normally because they do not have an executive sponsor, true or false. And that's another polling question if you want to answer that really quick, Justin. So when programs get off track, it's generally because they don't have an executive sponsor. Okay, so 75, 78, keeps going up. So back to 75, 75, 76. <laughs> so roughly around 76 to 77% of you say that it's true that when you don't have an executive or sponsor, that's exactly why some programs get off track. So let's, let's talk about myth number one. So myth number one, is that you need a senior leadership sponsor to have business on track. And I would say that that's a myth because although you need senior leadership sponsorship, that's not exactly totally needed. You actually need to look at your business a little differently. Senior leadership sponsorship is very important. But what you find with, the, with senior leadership is that they take our business in sound bites. And so they're going to support it and move on to something else. What's interesting is when you look at research, the learning truth is that your pulse on your business and your learning need and driving your learning programs is actually in the middle. That's where you're going to get the most traction. That's when you're going to get the most support. And as you look at some of the research that we shared earlier, that's where your biggest opportunity is going to lie. Those are going to be your champions. Now, there's a book that was written by um, Dr. Kiyosaki called The Customer Driven Company. And he talks about how information and learning and everything is driven with organizations and who knows what and who drives what. So it's interesting. If you were to look at learning, issues with the customer, data that's at your company, 100% of your issues that you have as an organization are known to the frontline staff. So they know 100% of really what your customer is experiencing. They know what their skill set deficiencies are, even though they don't tell you. They know what's going on in the organization. But as you move up in the organization, that know-how or having knowledge actually diminishes. So 70% of frontline supervisors know what's going on. 40% of your midline managers kind of know it. 20% of your top line managers, and here's some striking, 10% of your director, senior director and above kind of know what's going on, but only 3% of your executives truly know all the issues that are happening within your organization. So when you look at learning and you overlay that, an executive is, is executive sponsor is really important to get things kind of approved and move forward. But as you look at this, it's really in that middle, that 75, 40, 20%, that if you can leverage that part of your organization in learning and really engage them in the learning process, then you can really start to gain traction because then you're going to make learning relevant to them and they're going to start seeing you as a relevant business partner that's going to solve challenges, issues that they face on a daily basis. You're going to be that group that takes the pressure off of them and makes things more relevant and performance to grow. So makes sense. Hopefully that makes sense. So question number 45, <laughs> it feels like a, a lot of questions. Why is it that we plan for the first of the year rarely looks like what we actually deliver at the end of the year? So if you make learning, oh, so that's just a quick question. You can, you can type this question really quickly just in your, in your chat. So why is it that what we plan for at the first of the year rarely looks like what we deliver at the end of the year?
Yeah, business focus changes. That's right, Gary. It sure does. Changing business priorities. It goes on and on. Good one, Kevin. Good. Colin says priority changes. Poor planning, true need. That's great. That's absolutely right. Scope creep. Edwin, that's, I mean, how often in a, in a learning project are you, you know, they come in and change it four times before you actually deliver it. Hijack priorities and budgets. Katie, that's actually, I've been there, done that. So you do feel like you're hijacked sometimes. You kind of know what's going on and then all of a sudden it changes. Exactly. So as we look at that, thank you for sharing. As we look at that, learning myth number two is to align with the plan. So here's what's important about this. You can align to that learning plan all day long. But what you all know is exactly the truth. That plan changes and sometimes that plan changes with a hallway conversation. And then all of a sudden there's a different strategy and we're moving along in a completely different manner. And I can't tell you how many times that's happened in the large organizations I work for where I've thought my training plan is aligned. I've got 13 people working on a project to roll out some training that in the end just isn't relevant. So as we look at that, what's interesting is the learning truth to that is that you need to connect learning to daily business performance indicators. So although you want to have an arching plan that aligns with the strategy, because that means you're a good corporate citizen and you know what's going on in the organization, where you really want to focus is back in that middle and understanding how can learning be connected to the daily business indicators that you use in your business. So is that revenue, is that um, for call centers, that could be all of your call center analytics or sales or, or customer, service customer service numbers, customer experience drivers, engagement. What are the things that drive daily business performance? And that's where you wanna focus your learning strategies and objectives to really help in driving those learning performance. It will help build relevance, but it also allows you to have a closer pulse on the business to understand, okay, we need to adjust here because we're not driving the right business indicators. So the more that you can focus your energy on that, the more success that's going to happen. And in some of my experience, what we've done is we've started small. So we may pick one area that we're going to partner with that we really look at what their performance indicators are, and then we build learning around that and kind of walk hand in hand with the leaders to help that. So here's, a, here's another question. If you make learning mandatory, then you ensure leaders and staff are accountable to the desired outcome. So true or false? True or false? If you make learning mandatory, then you ensure leaders are accountable to the results. We got a lot of false. Okay, we can kind of close that one or broadcast those out. So you cut on <laughs> learning myth number three is to, to make learning mandatory. So this was a funny one because I've been in lots of business meetings where we sit down and a leader will look at me and say, well, just make it mandatory. And I laugh and say, well, I can make it mandatory all day, all day long, but it doesn't mean that they're going to take it, nor does it mean it's going to produce the results that we need it to. But the go-to answer when you talk to a lot of learning teams is they'll say, well, we just need to make that learning mandatory. What if we make learning required? And we go that back to that because it becomes a stronghold to be able to say, well, if we just track everyone and we just make them do it, then we're going to be able to show our relevance to the business because of the number of bottoms and seats that we have and not the impact that we've made. And that's been a shift over the last probably six years that I've seen is really starting to look at how are we making learning more relevant to the business. And that's, that's the learning truth number three, is that we need to make learning relevant to the business, not mandatory. We need to look at ways that when people look at learning, it's role specific or relevant to, to how they need to grow or it's based on um, how they can grow in the organization or move up to be a high potential. All of those things are really, really important as we learn to make um, learning more relevant. So the last thing is all around learning delivery, and there's been a lot around learning delivery in the last 10 years on how we can really make learning more mobile, uh, self-service, all of those things that are available in terms of blended learning. You've, you've heard all of those as professionals. 
So this is the other poll, Justin, if you want to put it up, is what learning delivery methods do you use? So just go ahead and check the ones that, that you use. A lot of on the job, a lot of classroom, absolutely. E learning, YouTube videos. Absolutely, good. So, as you look at, so 100% classroom e learning, you're 82%. We've got webinars, 70%. Obviously, our one today learning, so I guess that's a, that's a good way to go. YouTube videos, internal internet, on the job, um, on the job, exactly, big, big one on the job. Okay, we can close that one out, Justin, and go back. So as we look at this, the learning myth number four is build blended and robust training. So there is a time for blended and robust training, but what we're seeing, especially with this generation that's entering the workforce, is there's, there's actually a trend that's changing in learning. And the, the learning truth to that is that less is really more. And that's really scary for most learning uh, professionals, including myself, because I came from the school that you wanna build something that's robust, that's gonna give everyone the skills that they can have all of this, um, ways that they can access this learning and that they, they want to be in the classroom, they want to be engaged. And what we're seeing in, in all the research and looking at the generational research that's being done is that people want less, but that what they get, they want it to be quality, easy, and they want it to be simple. Um, people in, in this generation moving up would much rather go on YouTube and watch a two minute video on how to do something than sit in a half hour e-learning module or they like to have a tip card that walks them through graphically so that they can figure it out on their own. We're gonna see emergence of a lot of on-demand learning, and we're gonna talk a little bit about what's, what's emerging in that space. There's gonna be a lot more um, sharing with your neighbor, but that on-the-job will be important. What's interesting is if you look at the, the ADT 2015 current state of the industry report that just came out a couple months ago, Classroom training in 2013 was at 54%. It dropped a little bit in 14 to 51%. Tech-based is, is on a rise. It went from 38 to 41. That includes all of that social learning, kind of that technology base. The stagnant online e-learning actually rose a little bit to 28% over 27%. And self-paced learning actually is on the rise. It's now up to 26%. So people want to have that I the the iPhone kind of s training you don't have a huge manual when you get an iPhone it's pretty simple it has a little tip card and you kind of figure it out and that's really some of the trends as you look at how people want to learn and go from there so as we look at that we're really moving into something called point of need training and that's really starting to provide that that experience where you're learning just in time as you're right in a process or doing that. And one thing that's emergent is something called performance support. And just in your chat, how many of you have heard of performance support before? Um, performance support is basically, it's any learning modality resource or asset that is accessible and available at the, the moment of need. So it seems like a lot of you have heard it, awesome. So um, performance support is something that's been on the rise in the last probably eight years. It's becoming more and more um, available as people look at how they're launching systems and learning in the marketplace. This gentleman, Bob Moser, is really one of the, the thought leaders when it comes to performance support. I had an opportunity to meet him and spend some time with Bob and highly inspirational man. He comes from Microsoft, which is a very dynamic environment. I'm from Seattle. so. Uh, Microsoft is one of those companies that everyone wants to work for, but he led their learning and, and development organization. And what he found is that when you're working on a computer program, 
you really want to be able to figure it out as you're going along. You don't want to sit in a, um, a uh, classroom and learn through that, even though that's how they used to roll out all the Microsoft products. And he said one moment while he was actually watching a class take place, he said uh, half the class was already eight steps ahead of the instructor because they were playing and kind of going ahead. And so the instructor kept saying, coming back to him and saying, Bob, we just need to move, we need to make um, stop gaps in the program where they can't do that. And he kept saying, well, why? If they're learning on their own and they're moving forward, shouldn't that be a good thing? And so that's kind of the start of this, is how do we create a learning environment that's simple, that allows people to learn at point of need because we know they're going to retain it more. So um, this is a great opportunity to research a little more. Um, Bob is, uh, that's his um, website, AppliedSynergies.com. Um, like I said, he's post, he's you know an author and has written tons on the, the subject, but I think that that's going to be a really wave of the future to simplify how we're, we're developing learning and development and providing that and making it more relevant to our business. So now we're going to close off and just talk talk about strategies and 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 be able to open it up for maybe some of the challenges that you, that you're having and we can talk through those. So the first strategy is something that I think is critical and that's to really look at instituting in your organization something called a learning advisory board. So many organizations have these, but this is really setting a pretty um, rigorous process on having all levels of your organization involved in learning strategy and delivery and figuring out where do you want to best use your learning resources to drive the biggest impact to your business. So at, at Mannheim, we had a learning advisory board. It consisted of general managers in the field, vice presidents, all the way down to supervisor and frontline level. Um, they would come in on a regular basis, um, starting with the first of the year, we actually would go through the strategy. Again, we lined with the business strategy, but we also line with each business unit and looking at it from more of a, a macro level and spending time with them. And they would help us determine what are the learning priorities and they became our sounding board. So any, any change that happened to the organization, we went back to our learning advisory board and they're the ones that helped us to determine what we needed to change, what we didn't. They also became our evangelists in the organization around learning development. So they were the biggest champions, but the great part is they were the biggest champions exactly where we needed them, in the middle, driving, learning, adoption, and really spending a lot of time promoting the learning message and getting learning and development programs traction and getting out there. They also let us know when learning programs were not working. So they were our biggest asset when they found that learning wasn't relevant, they were able to come back to us and say, this isn't relevant, we need to change it, and here's how we need to change it. So it really created a very clear point of sight on what our learning team needed to be working on, how we're delivering to the business, how it was measured, and how it was evangelized in the business. It's very, very successful. They each have a role. They were voted in. They got to volunteer, but also be voted in by their leadership. So it was a privilege for them to be on that board. We treated them very well, and it created a lot of great relationships. And every two years, the leaders in those teams would rotate off of those boards, and they would recommend their replacement. Um, the other thing we were doing with the board that was very purposeful is we would go out and look for our biggest critics. So those are those leaders that may not support learning at a high level, but we felt we wanted a, ba a balanced viewpoint. And we really wanted those people that were really the naysayers to say, it takes too long, I don't have time, you don't understand our business, because we wanted to engage them and really have their ideas to make sure that what we were doing was relevant. The next thing is developing a system that we called and that I call pulse checks. So when we look at in the middle, if we look at that mid-range, getting the support from the supervisors and managers and driving the right business training that supports the business, I really found it valuable to have pulse check meetings with my entire client base on a regular basis. Um, I would meet with every one of our clients within the large organizations that I managed on a quarterly basis. So I would have sit down meetings or phone calls with them. I would have a script of quick measurement questions I would ask them to make sure that we were on track to what we were delivering. And then the other part would be an open-ended interview where they could give really open and honest direct feedback. 
about learning and development, about the business that that's happening, what were some of their biggest business challenges, how could we partner with them to help them solve them, what were some of the biggest customer issues we were dealing with. We really, in those pulse check meetings, our goal was to learn as much as possible about the business. So we wanted to know our products and services, we wanted to know what our biggest challenges were, and we wanted to know what how we could help support that in driving the right business factors. And then lastly, which is really important, is whenever possible to make learning role specific. So in an organization that's larger, many times what we found, and we've done this too, is we would launch a curriculum that was pretty broad in nature, but it didn't tie down to the role, and that's where we lost some of the relevance to drive the right behaviors, business, and the performance that we were needing to see. So one thing that change that we made is we started looking at roles in its entirety from a talent management perspective. So we would look at one role, and it would be a role that drove a lot of business. So it could be a, a central role. For us, it was a, what we call a vehicle inspector. And that vehicle inspector role was a hub for a lot of the business that we had for our customers. So we knew that was a critical role that we wanted to focus on. And we worked in partnership with talent management and we started with recruiting, onboarding skill sets. And we walked with them the path of looking at that from a holistic standpoint. So it came from onboarding, what onboarding did they need to be successful? And then what skill development did they need? What's their career path? And we started in that and we started in a really small subset. So it wasn't overwhelming, but we could work through all of those different skill sets, all the way on to offboarding in, in the instance that they decided it wasn't for them. We had all of those processes and training and learning connected through all of those. It was the thread through everything. Um, the interesting thing that happened with that particular project is it really brought learning and development to the table for a lot of business relevant challenges that were happening that weren't technically learning related, but we were able to come in and give maybe a different lens to look through or to, to talk about, well, have you thought about this from a learning perspective? This is probably why this isn't working as effectively. So it really added a lot of really good conversations, but it started building our reputation as a business partner and, and really helping with performance and driving the right performance. So those are three strategies that are, that are really important as we look at learning and development and the, the four um, challenges that we had, the myths, and then looking at some of the truths that we're having. So now I'm just gonna open it up for questions and um, then we can kind of close it. So as you've gone through, just you know, going through the presentation, what were some of your just key learnings or thoughts or what questions do you have that, can, that I might be able to help or answer or any challenges that you'd like to post to the group and we can help each other out? So Justin, um, one, uh, one question from Deborah Day, does this mean business leaders think learning is important, but that L&D is not instructing well or something else? That's a great question. I think that it's a little of both. I would say that when we looked at learning from an instruction standpoint, generally we always got good feedback. And if you look across the board and do some research on some of the surveys that are out there on actual instruction, those are pretty high. We have very skilled, learning professionals that are helping with learning. I think that where the challenge is with leadership is they're not getting that connection back on how they can support learning back on the job. So they see it as not as relevant as it needs to be. So one thing that you can do with that, Deborah, is just making sure that you have a good communication plan on when people go through learning that their manager knows how do they support that when they get back on the job. Because as you look at at learning in its whole, most of the performance that happens on the job is challenged with learning. We learn great, it's the application part that becomes the hard part. And many times that, that's equated to, to managers not supporting the learning that's happening back on the job. Great question. What other questions do you have? So this is your opportunity for, for lots of awesome and free advice. <laughs> okay. 
from my mic. The, the other thing too, and just, just thinking out that why, why you're thinking is that, um, that, that part of that management support, when we talk about in the middle, not only are they your biggest, um, supporter, but they also can be your biggest critic when it comes to that application. So, um, what's interesting was when you look at, um, metrics that matter, I don't know if any of you use metrics that matter, but they're really benchmarking some of the biggest ROI benefits to learning and development for some very large organizations. And what they're finding is that the biggest area that most organizations are struggling with is that is that question that says my manager supports my learning back on the job. So that can be a really, um, it's, a, it's a hard question to, to really um, answer. And it's also a hard question for learning and development to really get in there and figure out ways to get learning more relevant and to help those, those bosses. So Jessica, do we have any other questions that are coming up? There's a few folks typing. Uh, so let's just <laughs> hang out and see if they come through. But yeah, we'll probably get a couple. Thank you. That's a great question, um, Kevin. Kevin just said, how do you help ensure L&D partners are also aligned to the business, HR, talent management? That's a, you know, that's an ever-growing challenge, right? Is, is um, you know, we try and make that, that HR business partner role more meaty and really connecting to the business. I would say that we, um, what I've seen work really well is that, we looked at talent management in its in its holistic view and not segregated. So one thing that we made a change at is I made sure that when we looked at learning, we had key people on our, our learning advisory board that came from HR talent management and kind of that that part of the, the HR organization because they could add a lot of relevance to what's happening with HR and the business, but they also supported the learning standpoint. Um, and I don't, I don't know about some of you, but we um, had a very lean learning organization with 30,000 employees. So many times the learning that was taking place wasn't necessarily facilitated by anybody from my learning organization. We actually were looking to the HR business partners and talent management and OD folks to actually facilitate a lot of the training that was happening. So that partnership became really, really important but it also added a lot of validity to their role because they were really close to the business and could be seen as more connected. So that's a great, that's a great question. Um, Charles had a question, how does an organization get away from impromptu and particularly random analysis activities that result in T&D needs at the beginning of the year and move to more formal analysis approach? That, that's another great question. I think that for me, what's been successful is starting small. So not understanding that you have to go out and bite off everything, but maybe taking one area that you can move into a more formal analysis where you're starting to build a relationship with that area and that learning is driven based on what the business needs and, um, and it's responding to that. And, and really getting in there and having some best practices, but more importantly, what we found is having some big wins and some raving fans, if you will, will really help to drive a higher need in the organization and you'll be able to have more of the leaders in the areas going, well, hey, how are you able to turn the performance around in that call center team? Well, this is the approach that we used. Um, one challenge with that that we ran into is that people would often say, well, you're gonna do all this great stuff for this team, but you're never gonna get the resources to support that for the whole organization. But what we found is when we went on that approach and really had a more formal analysis and really working with the team and, and allowing their performance data to drive the learning, when, we, when other business units came up to us and said, hey, we want that too, we were able to say, great, this is what it's gonna cost. And what we found is the business was actually willing to fund it on their end. 
So to fund that, that whole training role, if they needed it, or to fund that process. And it was a way for us to build the organization from a learning perspective, but not necessarily have to take on everything. So that's a great, great question. Any other questions? Or any suggestions for, for Charles or Kevin or, or any, any, any of the other um, professionals that have chimed in with questions or kind of from your, your perspective? I think it looks like we're um, we're all out of questions here, Tabitha. So, <laughs> so, but I thank you very much. That was uh, that was awesome. I always I love these because I always I always pick something up uh, from them. Did you have a, a little bit more to do, or, or um, just let me know when no, you're ready? I, okay. That sounds great. Well, I love you know I love always to give time back. So you know I I'm of the less is more, and hopefully it was impacting for you. I'll just. Um, these are some of the resources that we can, uh, Justin has the, um, has the information and he can kind of post it and feel free that, you know, you can grab those resources and um, I can kind of go back to the, we can go back what you're learning. See, this is called a rapid review of all the great stuff you just learned in less than an hour. Uh, and just kind of leave you, my contact information um, is right here, my phone number, our website. Um, if I could be of assistance or if you just, assistance or if you just want to visit or have a challenge that you want to have a conversation about, um, I'm very passionate about learning and development and more importantly, I'm passionate about helping my colleagues be successful. So if I can do that, just, um, it's always nice to meet people and to talk through things and sometimes just a new perspective can help. But I am, um, I'm just excited to help. So there's my contact information, call anytime. And thanks again, Train Pros for hosting. And um, thank you for your interaction. I hope it was fun. Thanks, Tabitha. All right, this is Justin. I'm just going to wrap up. So if you can just give me a couple more minutes, I want to um, just go through a couple quick slides and get to the uh, the feedback. Um, we really take your feedback for these sessions seriously. We try to improve the sessions each time that we move forward, just the audio quality and other things. So. Um, so uh, thank you very much again, Tabitha. Uh, I want to just run over a quick uh, few slides here. Um, just check us out, Learning Technologies Master of Science that Harrisburg University offers. Uh, we're very proud of the program. Um, so be sure to check us out there. Big thanks to Alan uh, for introducing us and to Training Pros in general. We really uh, we, we love doing these. And you know I, every time, everyone I sit on, I get something out of it. So um, just we're really happy to partner with Training Pros on these and to be able to provide on this type of content. So I'm going to move to the feedback webinar. Please just answer a few poll questions. Thank you for joining, and we will see you on the next one. Thank you very much.